Luke 18 uh, captures a story that Christ once told. Um, and it says this, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And, and this truth has been echoed by many great leaders throughout time who have found the power of humility. The Apostle Paul echoed it to his young apprentice, Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul had learned the, the power of humility. What's more is Paul had learned the power of redemption in his own life. He had seen his own story turned around by the power of Jesus Christ. And Paul had learned that his redemption story made his life a, a beacon of hope to people who had yet to experience Redemption. Paul took joy in the opportunity to share his story, to share that story of redemption so that other people could also experience it. But the Pharisees, Pharisees like the ones that Christ talks about in his story, they believe the exact opposite. You see, anytime they approached God's commands, anytime they approached worship, they, they held self-righteousness like a badge of honor. They, they considered themselves set apart and, and, and loved to invest in the void between them and other people were better than that. God's laws for them, for their sin, for their disappointment. But we're above all of that. And I share this as, as a cautionary tale, much like that of Christ in, in Luke 18, to remind us that, that as we continue through this sermon series, as we continue through Christ's teaching and the Sermon on the Mount, specifically this conversation on God's law, that the temptation to take a similar approach to that of the Pharisees will continue to grow. And so I, I want to be very, very clear as we start, don't do that. Don't allow yourself to do that. Don't allow yourself to continue to hear this truth and further convince yourself, that's not for me, that's for them. The truth that we continue to walk through, it's for all of us. And last week, as we talked about anger, it's a very simple example of, of one that's very, very easy to dismiss. Anger is just so culturally acceptable in our time that it's very, very easy to overlook it as an issue, both in ourselves and in other people. We move on from it very, very quickly. But the topics that Christ continues to address are going to get more and more uncomfortable. And it is imperative that we understand that the truths that we will be unpacking are not for some people in this room. They are for everyone in this room. They are for me and they are for you. They are for all of us. We are all broken. We are all tattered by sin. We are all in desperate need of grace that can only be provided by a savior. And we have the opportunity in this series to lean into a conversation in which that Savior that we so desperately need illuminates the path to life, real life. Not some counterfeit version that we settle for, but the real genuine life that can only be found in Him. So before we go any further, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for our hearts. I want to pray for our minds. I want to pray that God gives us a, a, an intense sense of humility 
but that he would also give us wisdom and discernment to not only approach the truth that we're unpacking today, but to deal with that truth and understand that these are words we desperately need to hear, all of us. So, so pray with me. Father God, we thank you so much for your mercy. And God, we thank you so much for your grace. God, we acknowledge first and foremost that we need those things. We are broken people. We, we are people who were once lost, but by the light of Jesus Christ, we are now found. We were once blind, but we can now see. Do not allow us, Father, to choose blindness again by overlooking this truth that you're calling us to encounter, that you're calling us to deal with, that you're calling us to move through with the intent of moving towards transformation. And so, Father God, that's what we ask today. We ask for transformation. As we dive into your word, as we dive into this truth, I pray that it uh, enters our hearts and it brings about the change that only you can bring. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, with all that said, we're going to dive back into Matthew chapter 5. Uh, as you already know, we're in verses 27 through 30 today. And Christ starts out very similarly to the way he did last week. He says, you have heard that it was said. He's pointing back to, to long understood commandments. He says, you shall not commit adultery. Again, Christ is pointing to one of the OG commands, one of the Old Testament commands found in the original 10 commandments. And so again, this would have been something very, very familiar familiar to those listening. These were Jews who were raised in Judaism. They were very familiar with God's law. They were very familiar with the Ten Commandments. But I would surmise that this group is kind of sitting on the edge of their seats because of what we unpacked last week. Christ had started this way. You have heard that it was said, thou shall not commit murder. But then he went on to say, and I view anger just the same as I view murder. And so they're probably sitting on the edge of their seat wondering, okay, we understand adultery, Big no-no for God's people, but where's Christ going to take it this time? Well, he doesn't make them wait long. He goes on to say, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, Unlike last week, Christ doesn't immediately unpack the ramifications of breaking this commandment. You'll remember last week when, when he said, thou shall not murder, he immediately reminded them because if you do murder, you go before a town council and they execute judgment and, and that judgment comes quickly and there's a penalty that follows that and that penalty is death. And then he associated that with anger. He says, anger is the same thing. When, when we're guilty of being angry, we, we deserve judgment and, and death quickly follows the way of sin are death, but he doesn't go into any judgment. He doesn't go into any punishment with this one. Why is that? Because they're already aware of that punishment. The reality is that the punishment for all 10 commandments, if you were to break them, was in fact death. So Christ doesn't need to just keep emphasizing the same thing over and over and over again. It was no surprise that adultery resulted in death, but it would have been immensely uncomfortable to realize that God views lust in the same way. Because like anger, that is a sin that absolutely everyone is guilty of. Now, I feel like we should pause on that for just a moment because I don't know that everybody in this room would, would immediately agree with what I just said. So let's be very, very clear about what I just said. I said that everyone is guilty of Lust. Now, some very, very smart people have invested a whole lot of time and energy and work into trying to fully understand and trying to simplify what Christ is saying here. And that's culminated in lots of different views about this passage. In fact, there's a very popular belief held by a lot of very, very smart people that Christ is only talking to men here. And so they, they drastically reduce the pool of, of people that this truth applies to. And they say, this is not true for everyone. This is only true for men. Lust is a male problem. And so women, you are completely off the hook. There are other scholars who, who, who will, will take it even a step further, drastically reduce the pool of people this applies to even more and say that Christ is only talking to married men who are lusting over married 
women, meaning that, it, that if a married man is lusting over a single woman, totally okay. If a single man is lusting over a single woman, totally okay. Even those who believe that this applies to men and women will make the same argument that it's only wrong if it's a married individual lusting over another married individual. But I believe ultimately that both approaches are wrong. Because I think they fail to take into consideration one of the purposes of God's law. And we touched on this last week and we noted that one of the dangerous impacts of anger is that it destroys relationships. And God cares deeply about healthy relationships. God has gone to great lengths to ensure that we enjoy healthy relationships with him And with all other people, loving God and loving people is the foundation of healthy relationships. And it is a focal point of God's law, including the original 10 commandments. Let's be reminded of those 10 commandments real quick. You you shall not have any other gods, uh, no idols, don't misuse the Lord's name, remember the Sabbath, honor your father and mother, no murder, no adultery, no stealing, no giving false testimony, no coveting your neighbor's anything. Now, these are well understood by these people, but one of the primary intents of these is to help us better love God and love people. And they're actually set up that way. Think about it this way. When it comes to loving God, the first four commandments very much contribute to that. If you have no other gods before him, if you have no idols, if you don't misuse his name, if you keep the Sabbath and keep it holy, you will better be able to fully love God. God, they are all means to that end. And the last six commandments are the same thing in regard to loving people. If we honor our father and mother, if we don't commit adultery, if we don't murder, if we don't steal, if we don't give false testimony, if we don't covet our neighbors anything, we are better able to love other people. These commands are literally set up to enhance our ability to love God and love people. And Paul would, would, would build on this idea in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, he says this. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds this. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. What Paul is saying is the exact same thing I believe Christ is getting at. And it is this, the broad behavior limitations laid out in the 10 commandments were designed to emphasize the heart transformation that God desires to lead us all through. That we might become a people who fully and completely love God and fully and completely love people. Therefore, I believe that we can conclude that though the actual command states that any man who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart, the true spirit of the command is that adultery committed by a man or woman damages relationships and precludes our ability to fully and completely love one another. And therefore adultery is wrong. And lust committed by either a man or woman and focused on absolutely anyone but their spouse is equal to heart adultery, which is also wrong. And it is a serious problem for absolutely all of us. And so the necessary question becomes, what are we talking about when we talk about lust? What is lust? Well, well, though the term is most commonly associated with sexual desire, which is obviously how Christ is using it in Matthew chapter 5, its definition is actually a bit broader. Here's the definition of lust. Lust is a desire for what is forbidden. 
an obsessive craving for things that are contrary to the will of God, to drastically simplify it. Lust is an insatiable desire to feed your own selfishness. Lust is anything that convinces you that you are the center of the universe, that, that everything revolves around you and everything else in existence exists to serve the purpose of meeting your every want and desire. And so lust is anything that begins causing you to move in that direction. It's anything that begins causing your mind to move in that direction. It's anything that begins causing your heart to move in that direction. It's anything that begins causing your eyes to move in that direction, your hands, your mouth, your feet, absolutely any part of you begins moving in the direction of selfishness that is defined as lust. And so the next obvious question is, well, when does that happen? When does innocent desire, innocent attraction, or innocent curiosity become dangerous sin-forming lust? Well, well, we actually have a very good cautionary tale when it comes to this in the form of King David and the episode with, with Bathsheba. And we find this in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now we're, we're just gonna scratch the surface on this, but very, very powerful story. 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse one, tells us this. In the spring, at the times when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabab, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now, like I said, we're, we're only going to scratch the surface of this story, but, but I want to be very, very clear. It's a very painful one. It's marked by corruption and deceit and manipulation and murder and, and major consequences. It's absolutely heartbreaking. It, it's a tragedy, but it's a very, very avoidable one. In fact, the, the entire thing could have been avoided if David had simply been where he was supposed to be. This is the time of year where all kings lead their men out to battle, but David's men go out to battle. But where is David? David stays home in Jerusalem. He, he's supposed to be at war, but instead he's at home in some combination of boredom, loneliness, and simply being tired but unable to sleep got the best of him. Samuel continues, verse two. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him. And he slept with her. So the question becomes, at what point did sin happen? Well, adultery is pretty obvious. Adultery happened the moment that David slept with Bathsheba, a woman that was not his wife and was somebody else's wife. David has committed adultery. But when did lust happen? When did lust begin driving towards adultery? I believe it happened somewhere between David noticing Bathsheba and seeking more information about her. He sent one of his servants to, to learn more about her. I believe that somewhere in there, that's where lust happened. Had David gone to bed after noticing her and even after noticing that she was quite beautiful, I do not believe that that would have been sin, but he continued to inquire about her. Why? Because he was curious. An insatiable desire was growing inside of David. And we can naively make excuses at this point. Well, David is just being that. He's just being curious. I mean, I mean, this is equal to, to perusing her proverbial social media profile. There's no harm in that. We can make all the excuses we want, but they would be just that, naive excuses. The reality is that David has begun forming intent. I want to know more about this woman because I wanna be closer to this woman, because I want to have this woman. And before David even realized that desire had slipped into action very seamlessly, I would note. And before he knew it, she, she was in his home. 
And before he knew it, he had slept with her. And pretty soon Bathsheba makes contact with David and lets him know that she's pregnant. And so David begins to panic. And what does he do? He sends for her husband on the front lines. Why would he do that? He, he gets him to come home and he encourages him. Hey, go home and see your wife. David's hoping he can cover the whole thing up. Uriah goes home, sees his wife, sleeps with his wife. Everybody's going to assume the baby is his and I'm out of this mess. But Uriah won't do it. Uriah is so faithful to his calling as a soldier that he says, sir, I can't go home and sleep with my wife when all of my fellow soldiers are sleeping in fields. And so he won't go home. And so what does David do next? He gets him drunk thinking, surely if I get him drunk, then he'll go home. But he still doesn't go home. So what does David do next? Sends him back to war, sends him to the front line so that he'll be killed. So that he's out of the way. And after what David considers an appropriate time of mourning, he marries Bathsheba so that they can raise their kid and avoid any suspicion of wrongdoing. It literally takes a prophet by the name of Nathan to be stirred up by God and to come and confront David and call him out. Even when he initially calls him out, David still doesn't get it. Nathan has to spell it out for him. You are a problem before David finally wakes up for the first time time and says, wow, I've really messed up. You think, David, yeah, like, like when did that dawn upon you? You've messed up in a huge way, but that's what sin does. It finds a, a, a tiny window of opportunity, like innocent curiosity, and it, and it begins fueling very, very dangerous things like lust. And, and once it's been able to fuel that fire enough, that fire gets out of control before we even realize it. Desire is slipping into action seamlessly and a mess gets created. But sin jumps right back in, even in the midst of that mess and, and convinces us the only thing that matters now is cleaning up this mess by whatever means possible. And we're so desensitized at this point by sin that we don't even realize that our attempt to clean up this mess is just making a bigger mess. And eventually we have a painfully sobering moment where we step back and go, whoa, I've really messed up. And David's story, it's not unique. And this story isn't new. And we are not immune. Sin has one desire, and it is to ruin everything about your life and destroy you. And lust is one of the many dangerous methods that sin utilizes. So we must be vigilant and we must be ruthless to destroy it before it destroys us. Christ himself emphasized this back in Matthew chapter five when he said this, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, there's been entire movements of people who have taken this passage very, very literally. There's entire movements of monks, for example, who have taken this to the very letter and have actually mutilated their bodies in an attempt to ward off the onslaught of sin. And that is not what Christ means here. Christ does not mean for us to take this literally. In fact, if we did take it literally, it actually wouldn't do all that much good. I mean, think about it. Even, even if you were prone to lust and you gouged out your eyes and you were prone to sin and you cut off your hands, sin is still very possible especially when it comes to something like lust that, yeah, absolutely, it may enter our lives through our eyes, but it lives in our minds. The only way to cut off a body part, to ward off sin, would be to cut out your brain, to eliminate your ability to think about sin. But that would not lead to a very quality-filled life, and I don't believe that is by any means Christ's intent. Christ is speaking in extreme terms to help us understand that this is an extremely important situation and we need to take an extreme approach against sin. 
And so what, what I'd love to talk about for, for the rest of our time is just some helpful tools. And, and I want to be very, very clear that this is not a comprehensive list. This is not every way to combat sin or every way to combat something like lust, but, but they are very, very helpful tools. But I'll preface it all by saying that the, the journey towards overthrowing lust, the journey towards overthrowing sin in your life must be established on a healthy hatred of sin. Otherwise, you are fighting a losing battle. And what I mean by that, if, if your motivation to combat lust in your life is fueled just simply by obligation, it's something I'm supposed to do, so I'm gonna go through the motions, I don't really think it's that big of a deal, but I'll do it to appease everybody else, you're not gonna succeed. And if you're fighting lust simply for someone else, whether it's somebody you are in a relationship with, and maybe this is a preventative measure, you want to put steps in, in place so that nothing terrible does happen, or maybe something terrible has happened and you're kind of climbing out of a mess. If you're only doing this on behalf of somebody else or to avoid further trouble in that relationship, you will not be fighting long before you realize that you're fighting a losing battle. The only way to fight sin of any kind is to hate it and to accept that you are powerless against it. You need a savior. You need a king to lead you into and through this battle and you cannot serve two masters. You must hate sin and you must allow Christ to lead you away from it. Hate sin because of what it does. It severs your connection to God and life. It tarnishes your relationships with other people and leaves you isolated and alone. This war must start with a legitimate hatred for sin and a true desire to move away from it by the power of Christ. David did not find redemption until he stopped running. So, once you realize that sin is a problem and you invite Christ to start dealing with that problem, here are some helpful next steps. First one is this, understand and avoid the circumstances that are most conducive to sin growth. Understand and avoid the circumstances where sin is most possible. Addiction recovery counselors will also often use the acronym HALT, which means to stop. But here's what it stands for. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. The suggestion is these are all scenarios in which succumbing to temptation is very, very possible. And this is very, very true. I mean, if you don't believe me, if you've not learned this from your own experience, just look at David. What was David? He was alone and he couldn't sleep, so he was tired. And what did he do? He went wandering and pretty soon a desire presented itself. He got hungry to be close to a very beautiful woman. And then he got angry because societal standards said that he couldn't be close to her. And so he went after her anyway. David didn't stand a chance, but David very much could have avoided these. One, he could have simply been where he was supposed to be. David would have known that there wouldn't have been much for him to do and there wouldn't have been much positive that comes out of staying home all by yourself when everybody else goes to do what they're supposed to be doing. David could have been where he was supposed to be, but David could have also ensured that he just simply wasn't alone. He could have asked for help. And the fact of the matter is when, when it comes to sin, we know when these are most possible, okay? These very rarely creep up on you. Like they very rarely come out of nowhere. But even if they do, there is still protection by making the decision that I simply won't fight alone. I'm gonna invite someone else in to fight with me. Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The battle against sin is hard enough. Do not fight it alone. Invite somebody 
to fight alongside of you to ensure that you're not in scenarios where you're hungry, where you're angry, when you're lonely, when you're tired, so that you can avoid temptation at its very start. Second thing, cut off unnecessary distractions. Christ says in, in, in very severe terms, gouge out your eye, cut off your right hand. We know where sin typically hides. Okay, you, you, you've become painfully aware of that. You know what apps it's inside. You know what websites it's on. You know where to go to find it. Now, David's scenario, it's a very, very extreme one. Uh, if David had been sober-minded, he, he would have known inviting a married woman over to his house all by themselves was a recipe for absolute disaster. And he could have put measures in place to ensure that that wasn't possible. Our red flags of distraction aren't always as obvious, but we know what they are. And so when you know what they are, cut them off but cut them off in the same way and with the same intensity that Christ encourages us. When we gouge that eye out, when we cut off that right hand, what do we then do with it? We throw it away. Why? Because we don't want to be tempted to try to reattach it so that sin has another opportunity. And so let's think very, very practically about an example. Let's talk about uh, our phones. Phones uh, are a very, very powerful tool. They're also a very, very powerful distraction, especially when it comes to this concept. When we sit down and when we counsel people in regard to, to lust and sexual sin, nine times out of 10, a phone plays a role in that. So cut it off. Cut off the ability to be distracted by the sin that lives inside your phone. If that lives in a certain app, delete that app. If it lives on a certain website, block that website. If it, if it happens through a certain contact in your contact list, delete that contact. And I know what you're immediately gonna say. Well, I could just re-add that stuff. That is absolutely true. But there's also measures within your phone that you can take that make that more difficult. You can flip a switch inside your phone and put instant restrictions on yourself. And I know what you're thinking. Well, I could just flip that switch back. That is absolutely true. You can also password protect that switch. So it's even more difficult to flip it. And you're like, well, I'll know the password. All I got to do is put it in, flip the switch, and then I have access to it again. Well, here's an idea. Give somebody else the password. Let them set it. Give somebody else control. If we're gonna take this seriously, if we're gonna cut off unnecessary distractions, take the control out of your hands. If that's with your phone, give somebody else control of your phone. If that's your computer, give somebody else control of your computer. If that's your schedule and your whereabouts, give somebody else control of your calendar. Give someone else the keys. Ask somebody else to walk beside you. I will emphasize again, the battle against sin is hard enough. Don't fight it alone. Third thing, this, this is hugely important. Understand that light overpowers darkness. You, you know, darkness isn't actually a thing. Okay, you learn that in like fourth grade. Dar darkness is the absence of light. If light is present, darkness cannot be present. And we need to cut off the presence of darkness in our lives by utilizing the overwhelming presence of light we have access to in the form of Jesus Christ, our Savior, specifically in the form of God's Word. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Rather than allowing your thought life to overflow with temptations that have to be subdued, allow your thought life to overflow with Christ's truth so that there is no room left for temptations. Let me put it very, very simply. Spend more time devouring God's word than you spend desiring the things of this world. This is literally a life and death decision. The way of this world and the sin that it produces will always result in death. God's truth brings life. 
Now, one final thing we need to emphasize as we finish up, and I know this has been a doozy. I know we've thrown a lot at you, but this absolutely has to be said. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And that is you, and that is me. That is all of us. The enemy would love nothing more than to manipulate and corrupt our study of truth today and make it into a point of division. The enemy would love nothing more than to stir awkwardness in marital relationships, in dating relationships. The enemy would love nothing more than to stir up shame and fear and all kinds of other negative emotions that cause us to move away from each other rather than towards each other. The intent of God's truth today, the intent of these very firm words of Christ are to drive you closer to the heart of the Father and to drive you closer to his people. Do not allow this to result in isolation. Allow this to result in vulnerability. Do not extend judgment in regard to this teaching. Instead, extend grace and mercy. If you have failed in your battle with sin in any way, please hear this. So have I. And so has everyone else sitting around you. And if you are carrying guilt because of what you have heard today, if your eyes have been opened for the first time and you just realize, wow, I've really messed up, I need you to hear me say, there's grace. It's available and it will lead to healing. And that's what God desires for you, that you would be healed of the ramifications of your sin and no longer bound by them. The journey ahead, the journey of redemption, the journey of refinement, it will not be all sunshines and roses. I wanna make no mistake about that. Redemption never is, but it is always worth it. And if you need to confess something today, if you've been spiraling, if you've been making your best bigger and bigger and you just need hear somebody to hear that, we, we would love to be that for you. If you need to ask for help today, we, we would love to be that for you. If you need to hear about grace today because it simply does not compute for you, where you've been and what you've done does not translate to the reality that God wants to rescue, redeem you, and restore you, let us tell you about grace today. Please do not walk out of here without getting the necessary help today. And I'm gonna pray for us, I'm gonna pray over us, and then your campus pastor is gonna come up and reiterate that challenge. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your grace, and we thank you so much for your mercy. And Father God, again, we confess we need it. And so have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, we need your restoration. We need your redemption. Father God, we need your help. We acknowledge today that sin is a problem. Sin has one goal. That's to destroy us and everything about our lives. But Lord, you, you bring life and you bring it abundantly through Jesus Christ. And so may our eyes be lifted to him. Lord, I pray that you begin doing the restorative work that only you can do here and now. Lord, that, that begins with the acknowledgement of our sin. Lord, it, it begins with dealing with that sin. But very, very quickly, Lord, we, we know and we are confident that you will lead us beyond that sin. You will lead us into transformation. And, th and that's, Lord, what, what we seek and that's what we desire. And so for everyone in this room who's dragging their feet, for everyone in this room who is worried that the journey may not be worth it, that it may be too hard, Lord, I pray you bring peace. I pray you bring comfort. But I pray very quickly, Lord, that you inspire action because it is worth it. Because the wages of sin are death. But the gift that you've extended through Jesus Christ is eternal 
life. May we choose that life today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.